Hi, my name is Joe Goldman, and I am a co-chair of the Trust and Estates section. I want to welcome everyone to our program today, which discusses the very interesting challenges of planning for a celebrity's name, image, and likeness. And our speaker today, Chung Che, certainly has some significant uh, experience in this area, so I'll get straight to it. Um, but before, of course, there are a few uh, housekeeping announcements. So number one, you will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Your certificate will also be stored in the BHBA Plus, or BHBA Plus, our members only community. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included with your certificate. We also have a few words from our sponsors. And going with that, first, I would like to introduce Brian Joy of the Sanborn team. Thank you, Joe. Well, the Sanborn team has been busy handling wonderful referrals from this esteemed group. Last week, we got a referral for a vacant lot in Yucca Valley and another referral for a home in Malibu. <clears throat> Excuse me. I bring this up because the referring attorney was excited to refer the Malibu estate, but I expressed to him that just because we are located in Beverly Hills doesn't mean that we only work with large estates or prime locations. I was just as excited to receive a recent referral for a property in Palmdale. The most important thing for us is to be trusted by our clients and our referring attorneys. Any and all referrals are appreciated. Thank you and enjoy the meeting. Back to you, Joe. Great, thanks so much, Brian. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Arit Gadish from Geffen Real Estate. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. I'm Orit Gadish, broker and owner of Geffen Real Estate, specializing in representing trustees, executors, and administrators. I've been invited by the Placer County Bar Association to speak to their members. I'll be speaking on October 26th from 1 to 2 p.m., and the topic is probate and trust strategies in a declining market. If you'd like me to send you an invite to this webinar event, please email or text me. My contact info is in the chat box to the right. I'm also a CEB contributing author and author of the book, The Practitioner's Handbook for Probate Real Estate, available on Amazon. You can also check out my Probate and Trust Academy at probateandtrustacademy.com and my probate real estate blog at arigadishprobateblog.com. Enjoy your program and back to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Ari. All right, so the Trust and Estate section is also sponsored by Glen Oaks Escrow. Marcin Klein is a full service escrow officer specializing in probate, trust sales, conservatorships, and both court and independent administration of the State Act transactions. On a daily basis, Marcin works to ensure that even the most challenging escrows close smoothly and that her clients are beyond happy with their experience at Glen Oaks Escrow. Uh, we're also sponsored by California Title Company. California Title Company provides comprehensive and timely title insurance protection for home buyers, including first time home buyers, sellers, veterans, and military personnel, seniors, real estate agents and brokers, mortgage lenders, and commercial real estate professionals. Last but not least is Manufacturers Bank. Simplify your banking, let Manufacturers Bank do it for you. Do it, do it for you. Manufacturers Bank has a dedicated trust and estate banking team with the experience to handle all your banking needs. Contact Brian Flores, Vice President and Senior Relationship Manager for more information. Next, I'll hand it over to Jacqueline Yu for legal updates. Thank you, Joe. Our first case is Estate of Jones, heard in the First Appellate District, Division Three. In 1999, Charles A. Jones established a revocable trust, naming his daughter Sandra a successor trustee. His third wife, Helen, was not named as a beneficiary nor a successor trustee of the trust. Unsurprisingly, upon Charles's death, Helen petitioned for an interest in the estate as an admitted spouse. Sandra and Helen settled, agreeing the trust would pay Helen $3 million. The settlement agreement also provided that the funds would be paid out of the escrow from the sale of specified real property, which was the trust's principal asset. At the time of the settlement agreement, there was a pending sale of the property to Calvano Development, Inc. for $13.6 million. The trial court entered a stipulated judgment incorporating the agreement. However, the sale of the property fell through and Sandra's trustee failed to pay the $3 million to Helen. 
Helen filed a petition to enforce the settlement agreement under Code of Civil Procedure Section 664.6. The trial court denied the petition and concluded that the sale of the property was an implied condition precedent to Sandra's trustee owing Helen $3 million. Because the condition precedent of selling the property never materialized, the trial court held that the settlement agreement was unenforceable. Helen appealed. The appellate court reversed the trial court's decision. It reasoned that the settlement agreement contained two related but independent promises, each of which was recited in a separate sentence in the agreement. The first of the two sentences recited a promise that the trust will pay Helen $3 million. The second sentence specified the method of payment, that Sandra's trustee will pay $3 million from the escrow account from the sale of the property. Accordingly, Sandra's promise to pay $3 million to Helen is independent from, although related to, the party's agreement regarding the source of the funds. Thus, the appellate court held that although the settlement agreement contained a condition precedent as to the method of payment, the trustee's independent promise to pay $3 million to Helen was enforceable and payable upon the sale of the property. Our second case is a state of El Wardani, um, heard in the 4th Appellate District, Division 1. Ramsey Walter El Wardani died in his state in 2016. He was survived by what, his wife, Janine, and daughter from a previous marriage, Alexandria, Allie. In 2017, Janine petitioned the San Diego County Probate Court for letters of administration. She checked the box on the Judicial Council form indicating that she was a California resident and listing a P.O. box in California as her address. The probate court in December 2017 appointed Janine as administrator with limited authority to administer the estate. Janine also filed a creditor's claim against the estate, claiming that Ramsey had misappropriated her separate property and that she only discovered the misappropriation after Ramsey's death. In June 2019, Janine's letters of administration expired pursuant to a San Diego local rule. Janine filed to extend her letters of administration through July 2021. Allie asked the court to deny Janine's request to extend her letters of administration and instead appoint her as administrator of the estate. Allie argued that Janine did not qualify to serve as administrator of the estate because Janine was not a U.S. resident as required by California Probate Code Section 8402 subsection A4. She noted that Janine's September 2019 declaration supporting her creditor's claim confirmed her Mexico residency. In the 2019 declaration, Janine stated that she had resided in her Mexico home full-time since October 2014 when she and Ramsey moved there to retire and only extended to return to California once probate proceedings ended. Janine merely visited the U.S. on a temporary basis after moving to Mexico in 2014 without ever residing in the U.S. Janine, on the other hand, argued that she qualified as a U.S. resident based on her significant and continuing ties to the U.S. She reasoned that while she owned a home in Mexico, she was not a Mexican citizen and had no intention of becoming a Mexican citizen or resident. She grew up in California and all her children, friends, medical providers, accountant, and attorneys all lived in California. She had a California driver's license, voted, and paid taxes in California. Four years into a protracted probate dispute, the trial court removed Janine as court-appointed administrator because she was not a U.S. resident. The appellate court affirmed the trial court's decision, finding that as a matter of law, a resident of the U.S. under probate code section 8402 subsection A4 is a person who actually lives in the U.S. and is not merely present temporarily. U.S. residency for probate administration purposes is not established by mere connections alone. Now I'll hand it over to Dina Nam, our program co-chair, to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, good, after good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker today, Chung Che. Uh, Chung is a partner here at the firm Hoffman Sabin and Wanamaker in Los Angeles. He is a prolific speaker on many topics in the trust and estates field and has a certainly a long list of credentials, including being a certified specialist by the California Bar in Trust and Estates and Probate, as well as being a fellow of the American College Trust and Estates Council. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Chang and very excited to hear what he says. Um, I just wanted to say one final housekeeping matter before he starts speaking. Uh, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom um, where you can put in your questions for him. 
what we would like to do is wait for all the questions to be entered in and we can try to go through as many as we can at the end of the program. So please put them there. We'll be monitoring them and we'll go through them at the end. So without much further ado, Chung, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Dina. Uh, and thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Association for allowing me this opportunity uh, to talk with this wonderful group. Um, I'm gonna be sharing my screen because I do have a PowerPoint. Um, before I begin, I always like to start off with a, a little bit of humor and I emphasize the word little here. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, th there are two rules uh, to remember in the entertainment industry. Uh, first is always uh, to leave the audience uh, wanting more. And the second is, so that's uh, that's where the little bit of humor comes from. And I guess if you didn't get it, then you'll have to figure out. Uh, uh, but uh, if we were in person, I guess, uh, since we're not in person, I guess I don't have to wait for everyone to start uh, stop laughing. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, look, uh, the right of publicity is another way of saying, you know, the rights uh, to um, a, a celebrity or a famous person's uh, name, image, and likeness. And this is, uh, this is becoming a bigger and bigger uh, deal in terms of not just the entertainment industry, uh, but also in, in a lot of other areas uh, of life. Uh, for example, in recent days, um, you know, college athletes are able to now exploit their uh, name and likeness. Um, and so, uh, it's interesting how, you know, how the right of publicity has affected um, not just in different industries, but also by the way that the, the various states enforce these rights. And the other thing that I, I think that has changed in terms of the right of publicity is uh, in, in terms of uh, the Internet and social media. You know, I know a lot of uh, older people like myself, you know, might think social media is just uh, uh, for young people, you know, to figure out, you know, who the, you know, influencers are, YouTube influencers or want to be a YouTube influencer. But uh, uh, but social media, I think, has a, a various impact, uh, you know, significant impact in the entertainment industry. And I'll give you an example. Um, So Chung, I'm I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Could we switch your display settings over? We're seeing the dual screens. Oh, okay. Uh, what we the display settings up at the top. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Sorry about that. I would just figure it out, but uh, is that better? Unfortunately, we're still seeing the double screen. Are you able to go up to display settings up at the top and check? Uh, there should be a drop down menu. I don't see that at this time. Um, oh, okay. Hold on. Right there. I see it. I think when we swapped, there we go. There we okay. go. All Looks right. perfect now. So sorry to interrupt. Thank you. No, no, no worries. Okay. So uh, in, in terms of capitalizing on social media, uh, so there's some examples that I have in terms of like, for example, uh, Kylie Jenner, one of the Jenner daughters, uh, you know, and look, this isn't exact, you know, but I saw some studies in which it, it indicated uh, how how people capitalize on social media. And one of the uh, sites had um, indicated that Kylie Jenner gets somewhere between, you know, somewhere around 1.2 million for each of her Instagram posts. And, and a lot of that is due to the fact that if you've got 141 million followers, then you, you have a significant influence um, and therefore you can monetize it in a, in a significant way. Uh, LeBron James, the basketball player, uh, apparently his tweet can be worth somewhere between somewhere around 140,000 because he's got over 23 million followers. And somebody that's lesser known, like Frankie Munitz, uh, might only get a couple hundred dollars uh, just because of the lack of followers that he has in relation to the others. And in fact, you know, if you take a look at Kylie uh, Jenner, uh, she's actually built her billion-dollar cosmetics uh, and fashion industry. Uh, on her own advertising, because you know when when she gets a new product, 
if she posts it on her Instagram post, then she, millions of her followers will go out to the store and buy her product. Uh, similarly, in the entertainment industry, I, I understand that casting agents will hire based on followers. So if you've got two individuals who are uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, similarly uh, needed for for a, a particular part, you might go with the one with more followers because that's ready-made advertising. So let's let's go, uh, you know, directly into uh, you know what right of publicity is, and uh, the right of publicity is the right to control the commercial name of uh, commercial use of name, likeness, and image. Um, it, it, and in the famous Topps chewing gum case, uh, Judge Jerome Frank indicated that the right of publicity recognizes an independent right to protect the economic interests from unauthorized commercial appropriation of celebrities' personas. And so, you know, some people get mixed up between right of privacy and right of publicity. And, you know, look, right of publicity uh, has evolved from the right of privacy, but right of privacy is more of a personal emotional interest, whereas right of publicity is actually a property right. And because it's a part of property right, you can sort of uh, figure out how to determine the damages. The, and that's determined by the fair market value of the celebrity's identity uh, to the profits of the person uh, who's infringing on that right. And, and the damage to the celebrity's future licensing opportunities. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, not only is this important in terms of while the celebrity is still living, but in many states, the right of publicity is also transferable and descendable. And we'll talk about that more as we go on. Um, and the last thing is that, uh, you know, right of publicity, you know, as, as I said, it can be descendable to the states of the celebrities. Uh, but right of privacy essentially dies with the death of the celebrity. So um, in, in terms of, you know, because the right of publicity is a state right, you sort of have to take a look at how many states actually recognize the right and what do they exactly recognize. Um, I believe this, uh, this number may be a little short because it's always evolving. And there's a number of states that, you know, recognize the common law right of publicity. Uh, but it could be as many as 36 states recognize the right of publicity, and 25 of those recognize a postmortem right of publicity. And you can see some of the notable states. Obviously, for us, California is one of them. Uh, but uh, for many people who have uh, clients who are bi bi coastal, uh, New York. Um, uh, has uh, recently enacted their right of publicity because before they didn't. Um, and, and so these are some of the other states that are relevant, I think, uh, uh, in terms of looking at their right of publicity. So before I get into the variances, uh, obviously, you know, we don't have the length of time in this presentation to go over each of these states, uh, you know, statutes or, or the way they enforce their common law right. Uh, so what I wanted to do was I wanted to highlight some of the more interesting states and the states that are obviously relevant for our practice. And so if you take a look at the variances in these state rights, um, you know, Utah is uh, an, an interesting example because in order for the right in Utah to be a right of publicity in Utah to be descendable, uh, it requires the celebrity to have commercially exploited uh, that that right during his or her lifetime. So it's a, like a precondition uh, to be able to have that right being descendable. And Utah is one of the few states, I think, that has that uh, sort of requirement. Um, and, and so when you're evaluating uh, exactly what is protected, uh, you really have to take a look at each of the statutes to understand what are the protected attributes to this right of publicity uh, for each of the states. So for, for example, California, uh, there's a civil, our civil code section 3344.1 indicates that beneficiaries, heirs uh, have the right to control uh, the exploitation of the deceased personality's name, voice, signature, photograph, or likeness. Uh, New York is a little bit more limited uh, under New York civil rights section 51. Uh, the rights are limited to the personality's name, portrait, picture, or voice. Um, and Indiana is broader uh, 
because uh, not only uh, does Indiana include the rights that I indicated, but they also include rights um, you know, that are distinctive appearance, mannerisms, and gestures. So for those uh, that are like myself, uh, who are a little bit older, you know, you can think of like Johnny Carson with his uh, unique mannerisms um, or uh, Bob Hope, uh, his uh, profile with that distinctive nose, uh, those would be all protected in Indiana. Uh, the next thing that you need to take a look at is really how long uh, can this be enforced uh, in each of these states? Washington is one of the few states that have uh, a dual uh, year, uh, meaning that it's 10 years after the death of the individual if there was no commercial value to their uh, uh, right of publicity, and 75 years if there was commercial value. In New York, uh, it's 40 years after the death of the celebrity. In Indiana and Oklahoma, it's one of the longest with uh, 100 years. Tennessee has an interesting uh, duration because it allows uh, the enforcement to occur indefinitely so long as the state continually exploits the celebrity's attributes. And, and I think there you can sort of um, wonder, you know, the question of what what does continually exploiting, you know, continually exploiting mean? Uh, how much do they need to do? And in California, it's 70 years. But it does, you know, based on the famous Marilyn Monroe case, it does reach back to celebrities who died on or after January 1, 1915. In Illinois, it's 50 years, but it only applies for celebrities who died after the enactment. And I think it was enacted in 1999. So it, it wouldn't apply for celebrities who died prior to that. So the next thing that you sort of have to ask yourself is, um, you know, what what is required to be able to uh, utilize the state statute uh, or the state law uh, in terms of enforcing this right of publicity? Um, in California, it requires the deceased celebrity to have been a California resident, and and for California. Uh, you know, I think they define their residency as just being present in California, other than for temporary or transitory purposes. Uh, in New York, you you must have been uh, the celebrity must have been domiciled in New York, which basically means it's a permanent and primary residence, uh, not just a place of abode. So it's a little bit harder requirement. And then in Indiana, it only requires that the act or event occurred within Indiana. So if something happened in Indiana, you can protect that uh, performance uh, regardless of the uh, celebrity's domicile, residence, or citizenship, unless uh, the, the celebrity had died intestate without any surviving heirs. Uh, Washington has a very broad statute, uh, similar, um, uh, I mean, not similar to Indiana, but it has a broad statute in, in terms of what it can enforce. Uh, but it's been challenged under um, under a recent uh, case involving the late guitarist Jimi Hendrix. Um, and under that uh, court ruling, the courts uh, ruled that applying uh, the Washington statute, regardless of domicile, was considered to be arbitrary and unconstitutional. I think that has a lasting effect because uh, I think some practitioners would look to Washington to still be able to enforce uh, the right of publicity, even if their state uh, didn't have a statute. So uh, this case may undermine that sort of rationale. Hawaii and Nevada have similar broad statutes as Washington. There are other, um, other uh, authority uh, for the right of publicity, and that is uh, you know, under the Restatement of Unfair Competition, Section 46 says, one who appropriates the commercial value of a person's identity by using it without the consent of the person's name, likeness, or other indicia of identity for purposes of trade is subject to the liability for the relief appro appropriate under the rules stated in sections 48 and 49. So what, what, what do we do about protecting these uh, publicity rights? Well, one one thing, and this is uh, this comes often uh, up very often with our celebrity clients, and that is that you know whether it's a business manager, whether it's an entertainment attorney, whether it's somebody else, um, you know most individuals would like for their 
uh, sort of advisor, trusted advisor to be able to continue to exploit the name and likeness. Uh, and, and, and of course, they want their beneficiaries to receive the benefits of that exploitation, but they don't want necessarily their family members controlling uh, the name and likeness. So if you want to do that, if you want to best control in a single individual, then you probably have to create a uh, name and likeness trust. Obviously, you can call it whatever you want, uh, but uh, naming that uh, advisor, trusted advisor as the trustee uh, to be able to continue to do what they've been doing all along. If there isn't a specific provision uh, under the will or trust, then the name and likeness uh, rights pass under the residuary provisions of that instrument. If the deceased celebrity dies intestate, then the rights pass to the statutory heirs. So, you know, one of the major issues um, that, that occurs in these sorts of cases is what is the value of these, uh, you know, uh, these rights, the name, image, and likeness? And, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics uh, with regard to the, like, the Michael Jackson case. Uh, but the premise is that the, the valuation would be done where the name and likeness is to be valued at the moment of death with knowledge of the death, but without regard to post-death events. So, you know, it could be things that occur later that, that one might think that alters the value, but it's still to be valued at the moment of death with knowledge of the death. And, you know, look, in the vast majority of cases, um, most clients, even, even if you think they're famous, um, will have a nominal value because the celebrity really can't make the public appearance no longer making the films, TV shows, or music recordings um, appear in ads and stuff. I know that there are certain ads, you know, people talk about, you know, Fred Astaire and the vacuum, you know, commercial uh, where maybe you use holograms or, you know, digital images. But, um, but in most cases, you know, that's why um, uh, the, the celebrity's uh, name and likeness might have nominal value. I had, a, I had an IRS auditor once uh, say that, uh, look, uh, you know, we know that the name and image uh, and likeness of value is high because we saw that uh, the, the deceased celebrity make a very short public appearance and got uh, enormous amount of money. Uh, of course, the response to that was that celebrity can no longer make that appearance, uh, even if they can, you know, achieve a great uh, windfall by doing so. Uh, there are certain exceptions uh, to uh, th this sort of nominal value if the products uh, are associated with a certain celebrity, uh, for example, Elizabeth Arden with Liz Taylor, then there might be greater value. Um, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, one of the most important things uh, with, with respect to valuation is, of course, needing a qualified appraiser. And typically, the qualified appraiser, and they did this in the Michael Jackson case, um, uses two variables uh, for this discounted cash flow model. Uh, the first is they, they try and project the future cash flow stream um, of the exploitation. And the second is they apply a discount rate, uh, essentially the time value of money in computing the present value of this future uh, stream of cash flow. So here we have uh, the estate of Michael Jackson, right? Um, so uh, Michael Jackson died in June 25, uh, 2009. Uh, I actually remember it well because, um, you know, if, if you were in Westwood at the time, uh, Michael was, uh, I believe, taken to UCLA Hospital in, in Westwood. And, you know, that was the first and only time I saw just a, a huge number of media helicopters hovering around UCLA, around Westwood, and, and it was uh, it was definitely quite a spectacle. Uh, I'm not going to go through you know all the timeline for the Michael Jackson case, but you can see that you know Michael died in 2009. Uh, the tax return was filed in 2010, uh, but the uh, final tax court decision uh, wasn't issued until two, uh, 2021. So you can see how long it, it, the, the time it took to come to a resolution. So the issues uh, before the tax court 
Uh, and I think, you know, the reason why I'm going through the Michael Jackson case is uh, because my uh, partner, Paul Hoffman, uh, represented the estate, uh, but also, you know, just because it's very interesting in a number of different ways. So the issues before the tax court uh, were really three issues, uh, right, in terms of valuation. There was the name and likeness. Uh, there was uh, Sony ATV, which held the, the rights to the Beatles catalog, uh, and then MyJack Music, uh, the, the rights to um, uh, Michael's uh, own songs. Um, and I won't go into detail regarding Sony ATV and MyJack Music, um, because this is really a discussion on uh, right of publicity, name and likeness. So I'll focus uh, you know, my discussion here on name and likeness. And so the IRS uh, or uh, the, the estate reported on uh, Michael's uh, estate tax return, Form 706, it reported a value of $2,106 uh, for his name and likeness. I know a lot of people get a chuckle out of that, uh, in part because of the discrepancy uh, with the IRS, who uh, provided a deficiency notice with a value of over $400 million dollars. Um, I said that correctly, $400 million, uh, but I'll explain why uh, that $2,000 number was reported on uh, Michael's initial estate tax return. Uh, the IRS on the brief for the tax court uh, reduced the value, their initial value uh, dramatically to $161 million. Uh, the estate on uh, our brief, uh, uh, you know, uh, put it put the value at little over three million, uh, and the tax court decision came at little over four million. Uh, so we believe that was an uh, overwhelming victory for the estate. Uh, one of the interesting things regarding this case, uh, you know, when you take a look at the difference in value and things like uh, undervaluation penalty and you know things of that nature. It is interesting to note that the tax court held that there were no penalties uh, since the valuations were reasonable. Yeah, there, there's so many factors that are uh, very interesting uh, with regard to the Jackson case. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details of the case because I think there's been many CLEs and other discussions that went through uh, the case in detail. I want to highlight four issues that I, I, I believe to be very, uh, very interesting uh, for, for the court uh, or in, in the case, I should say. Uh, one is the value at the time of death. Um, you know, there, there's these things called Q scores, uh, which I, you know, I think uh, people who understand the entertainment industry know what it's about. But the Q scores really measure two aspects uh, of a celebrity. One is sort of the familiarity, uh, you know, essentially, do you recognize the celebrity? And then the other is, uh, does the celebrity have a favorable or negative view uh, by the general public? And, and so if you have a positive Q score, then you know, you're, you're familiar, but also you, you're thought of in a positive light. If you have a negative Q score, then you're familiar, but you're thought of in a negative light. And so, so what happened with Michael uh, in terms of, you know, and everyone knows, you know, that, um, or many people may not, you know, or some people may not know, but Michael did not uh, have a favorable public view uh, at the time of his passing, you know, whether it's uh, all the allegations of, uh, you know, sexual abuse or other things. Uh, but anyway, um, he basically had negative Q scores uh, for a number of years prior to his death. Uh, in fact, the last two years of his uh, prior to his death, the entertainment industry basically said, we don't even need to have Q scores done for Michael because that's how irrelevant he sort of became at that point. And so that's how you understand, you know, it wasn't that, you know, the $2,000 was, uh, you know, came out of thin air, but it was a careful evaluation of uh, what happened prior to his passing, uh, the fact that he really had no income generated over the last 10 years uh, of his life. Uh, the second thing uh, that I thought was noteworthy in terms of the case uh, was that the IRS expert, there's a, a man named um, Wes Anson, 
and he considered uh, uh, foreseeable opportunities. And he just thought like Michael's estate is just going to blow up, uh, right? Uh, and, and that there would be theme parks, there would be restaurants, there would be a Broadway musical, there would be all these things. Um, and the court rejected that an analysis as fantasy. Um, you know, not not that there wasn't anything that was foreseeable in terms of ha things happening. Obviously, for a lot of musicians who pass away, there's always a bump up in the music um, and, and the listening and all that stuff. But um, uh, but that uh, uh, the appraiser, the IRS's expert, uh, Mr. Hansen, that he over that he valued the wrong asset. Um, obviously, Michael, uh, being a musician, had copyrights, he had trademarks, and he had other things. And those were separate assets that were valued separately in Michael's estate. And what happened was that uh, Mr. Anson, you know, valued sort of mixed some of these assets. Uh, so he, he valued in terms of the tax court, uh, he didn't value the correct asset all the time. Uh, not only that, he took into account unforeseeable events. As I indicated, there was no revenue that was generated by Michael uh, in his in the last 10 years prior to his uh, passing uh, in terms of exploitation of his name and likeness. And, and so, you know, a lot of these things uh, were deemed by the tax court to be unforeseeable events. And then the last thing is that he over overstated the assets value, meaning that he had much higher cash flow analysis than what was considered to be reasonable. Um, and so uh, the, the, the third sort of interesting factor in terms of the Jackson case is this idea of whenever you're dealing with an asset that can be enhanced by its management, then there's two factors to that, um, uh, to valuation. You know, you have to have a value for the asset itself, and, and you have to sort of figure out what does effective management add to the value of the asset? And that's what we had here. Uh, John Branca, one of the leading entertainment uh, lawyers um, in Los Angeles and, and across the country, uh, effectively managed uh, uh, Michael's estate and, and grew it uh, in, in an enormous uh, fashion. And, but, but the tax court made a note that you know, you have to separate out what what is to be the actual asset, Michael's name and likeness versus uh, Mr. Branca's effective management. In fact, I think one of the interesting quotes that came from the tax courts indicated that uh, that Mr. Branca had managed with stunningly greater competence uh, the the uh, right of publicity than Michael had in his own hands. Uh, so that sort of uh, told uh, a, a story there. And then and then the last thing that I thought was extremely interesting was this uh, sort of idea of synergy or bundling of rights. Uh, because Michael was a singer songwriter, uh, he owned the copyrights to his music. He owned the trademarks, you know, for for any unique properties. And then um, he owned uh, his name and likeness. So the idea that was presented by the IRS expert is that if you have all three sort of assets, the IP rights, uh, would you have greater leverage in dealing with third parties in terms of exploiting the name and likeness, as opposed to if you were just, you know, if you only had the name and likeness, but didn't have the copyrights and trademarks. Um, and, and, and it's an interesting notion, but the tax court ultimately ended up with uh, that it didn't add any additional value. Um, you know, and, and, and in part, I think the court indicated that the estate and the IRS both valued all of those assets separately, and so gave the indication that they were to be separately valued and that there wasn't this sort of synergy or bundling of the assets. One of the other interesting things with regard that happened uh, with this uh, case is, is uh, the credibility of the IRS expert, uh, Mr. Hansen. And I wasn't there, but my partner, Paul, was there uh, at the court, and he always described it as like a Perry Mason moment uh, where our um, uh, the, uh, the trial attorney 
for the estate had basically uh, got uh, uh, the the witness to admit to uh, that he lied on the stand. And in fact, the, the one of the quotes from the uh, tax court judge uh, said, as the commissioner's only expert witness, Anson's credibility was an especially important part of the case. And it suffered greatly at trial, asked about the effect on himself and his firm if the commissioner prevailed. He responded, I have no idea. I've never worked for the IRS before. Later, when asked whether he or his firm had previously been retained by the commissioner to write an intellectual property valuation in Whitney Houston's estate tax case, Anson replied, no, absolutely not. That was a lie. Anson also testified not, not, neither he nor his firm ever advertised to promote business. That was also a lie. Um, and it's interesting because I don't know uh, that he needed to lie about, you know, I think there's plenty of uh, with, uh, experts and uh, plenty of uh, appraisers who work on both sides, you know, in terms of for the taxpayer and for the uh, for the IRS. So I don't know why he felt compelled that he had to lie about that, but uh, it did undermine his credibility in in, in the tax court's eyes. Uh, one of the interesting conclusions to this you know, case is, is the conclusion that uh, that the tax court judge. Uh, came away with uh, regarding name and likeness, and I think it it holds true if you if, if you've worked on uh, these types of situations for a long time. And, and he states that popular culture always moves on. There will come a time when Captain EO joins Monty Brewster and Terry Forbes as names that, without googling, some sort of so, sort of sound familiar, but only to people of a certain age or to students of entertainment history. And just as the grave will swallow Jackson's fame, time will erode the state's income. Uh, the value of what is left, uh, no matter how well managed, will now dwindle as Jackson's copyrights expire and his image and likeness shuffle first into irrelevance and then into the public domain. There are other factors uh, that were relevant in the Jackson matter, but I won't go into those. Um, I, I did talk about the Q scores and other things, but uh, I won't go into those uh, at this moment. So what do you do with uh, your, your client's name and likeness rights? You know, and what can you do to avoid, you know, this fiasco of a valuation issue that occurred like in the Michael Jackson case? Uh, although I will say that I think uh, it's a unique case because I don't think that most celebrities will have that uh, sort of, um, you know, issue. But um, uh, one of the things, I guess, uh, it, it depends on obviously the situation, as all uh, lawyers say. But, uh, you know, if the, if the celebrity is married uh, and wants to leave the, the rights to uh, the surviving spouse, then one way is to leave it to the marital trust. Um, and I think that does a number of things. You know, obviously you can leave it outright if that's what they wanted uh, to do, but often case, uh, you know, they want to also leave it to the remainder beneficiary. Uh, but uh, if you do that, then then the valuation issue uh, becomes less relevant because, you know, it's going to, you know, assuming that the surviving spouse is a, a U.S. citizen, then it's going to have a dollar for dollar, you know, marital, unlimited marital deduction. Um, and the other thing that I think it, that, that it'll do, uh, not, not only to provide disincentive for the IRS to, you know, um, you know go after the value issue, uh, but, um, you know, if, if the surviving spouse uh, lives for a long time, then it's sort of, you know, as, as the tax court judge had indicated, it'll diminish in value over time. And, and perhaps when the surviving spouse, uh, uh, you know, passes away, when the valuation then becomes relevant, it'll have a much less value. And, and, and if anything, you know, you'll have a, a stream, you'll have a, a, you know, understanding of what happened during the time of the surviving spouse's life, where you can present that, um, you know, value uh, to show what it's truly worth. Uh, similarly, you can leave it to a charitable foundation. Uh, but one thing that you have to be careful is, uh, as in the Robin Williams case, um, Robin Williams, the comedian, had restricted the usage of his name and likeness uh, for 25 years after his death um, and then gave it to um, his uh, foundation, the Windfall Foundation. And where this becomes a problem is 
essentially the matching of the value of the asset versus the charitable deduction. So ideally, what you want is you want the asset value to match the charitable deduction. Therefore, it zeroes out any, any possible estate tax value. However, if, if the asset is valued without the restriction and, and is valued in full, but uh, it's determined that the foundation only got the uh, asset with the restriction, which uh, you know, devalues the asset, then you'll have a mismatch in terms of the asset value and the charitable deduction, and you could cause a significant estate tax uh, problem. Um, and I'm not sure if there's been a resolution in the uh, Williams case, but um, uh, but anyway, that's something. And, and as my one of my partners likes to uh, say, you know, it's it's like somebody thinking that um, you know if I just bury myself in my Ferrari, you know, then it'll be valued uh, like a casket. Uh, and not the uh, actual value of a Ferrari. And so uh, therein lies the problem. Uh, another, another possibility in terms of dealing with the valuation issue uh, of this right of publicity is to fix a portion uh, uh, for the taxable gift with the residue passing you know, to either a spouse or charity uh, where you get marital deduction or charitable deduction. And what I mean by that is if you say, you know, uh, the the child gets 50 million and everything else passes to charity, uh, then really all the IRS can get is the value, you know, in terms of the taxable gift being the 50 million. Uh, and perhaps, you know, they'll be less uh, inclined to argue for a specific value of a specific asset if if they understand that that's all they're going to get. So, so that's another uh, possible technique to be able to um, deal with this issue of, uh, you know, valuation. Um, I, I sort of talked about uh, these, you know, in my experience uh, dealing with IRS auditors in terms of the valuation issues. Obviously, I talked about finding a qualified appraiser, uh, but, you know, you'll have uh, auditors focusing on different things. In fact, it's interesting because I had you know, the, in, in the Michael Jackson case, the auditor uh, focused on post-death earnings uh, because that's where the significant value came. Uh, but in another case, and interestingly enough, it was the same auditor uh, for another celebrity client. Uh, that you know, the, the auditor in that case focused on the pre-death earnings, and so it was interesting to uh, ask the question, you know, well, which is the relevant uh, earnings that you want to focus on, you know, and. and and I think her response was, it depends, you know, so uh, anyway, the, the other thing, and, and this touches upon the management uh, argument that, that I had mentioned earlier in the Jackson matter, there's a slippery argument uh, that the IRS seems to be uh, raising, and, and that is that you know, you could present the numbers, you know, pre-death in terms of, look, there's very little exploitation of the name and likeness, uh, but for some auditors, it doesn't even stop there. And you could even show the numbers post-death that there isn't uh, much there. Uh, but the question that has been posed by some auditors is that, you know, they wonder whether, is it because you couldn't exploit the uh, name and likeness or was it because the taxpayer chose not to exploit the name and likeness? And then the second question is, you know, did they, even if they exploited the name and likeness, did they maximize the exploitation of that name and likeness? You know, I mean, it's almost like asking, you know, should everyone be hiring John Branca to exploit the name and likeness, you know, post death? And, and you know, it's a slippery argument because I'm not sure if you can come to a resolution if you're always thinking in the theoretical, you know, uh, about, you know, not only uh, did you not exploit it in the right way, but, you know, maybe you didn't maximize the value. So, so that's something that people need to watch out for when you're dealing with the IRS. The, the last uh, part of my uh, discussion, I wanted to talk about three interesting cases because, you know, one, I just think that they're interesting, but I think it also highlights uh, the extent to which, um, uh, uh, the, the, that that uh, name and likeness uh, name and likeness is prevalent in, in a variety of manners. Whether uh, someone's name 
or actual likeness is uh, utilized. And so there's three cases that I wanted to um, talk about briefly. Uh, the first is the Michael Jordan versus Jewel Food Stores case. And what happened in that situation was, I think, uh, a number of years ago, uh, Sports Illustrated had issued a commemorative issue, uh, basically celebrating Jordan's, um, you know, historical career. Um, and Jewel Food Stores took out an ad in that uh, issue, uh, basically congratulating uh, Michael Jordan and saying something to the effect that we at Jewel Osco, you know, food stores uh, want to congratulate, you know, the greatest of all time or something like that. And it had uh, Jewel's, uh, you know, logo and everything like that. And, you know, it seemed harmless uh, unless your name was Michael Jordan, uh, because Michael didn't, didn't, didn't think that the ad was appropriate uh, because uh, it was uh, utilizing his name um, and, and, and sort of indicating, uh, you know, indirectly that, you know, perhaps Michael Jordan is tied with Jewel Osco or Jewel is at, at least advertising, um, you know, utilizing Michael's name. And the court uh, in that case uh, did indicate that it was a commercial speech uh, and it did infringe upon uh, Michael's uh, uh, right of publicity. Another case, uh, uh, Vanna White versus Samsung Electronics America. Uh, it's an interesting ad in which Samsung basically was uh, trying to say that, you know, in, in X number of years into the future, and it was, I think it was a print ad with a robot who was sort of dressed like Vanna White uh, with, with a, some screen that looked like uh, the Wheel of Fortune. Uh, but I think Samsung was trying to say that, look, even if, uh, you know, Vanna and, you know, Wheel of Fortune is long gone, um, Samsung will still be there, uh, you know, and, and sort of uh, indicated that through this robot, uh, that the robot would be here long after. It didn't use Vanna's name, it didn't use her picture, it didn't use, you know, Wheel of Fortune, uh, but it was clear, you know, from any, you know, from the court that was uh, issuing the ruling that, it did utilize um, uh, Ms. White's uh, identity and therefore found in her favor. Uh, and then the last case um, that I wanted to talk about was um, uh, Carson, Johnny Carson uh, versus Here's Johnny Portable Toilets. Um, and this is, this is an interesting case uh, because there was a company called Here's Johnny Portable Toilets and they didn't utilize, you know, Johnny Carson's name or image or anything regarding the Tonight Show. Uh, but, uh, you know, we all know that, you know, here's Johnny is the famous phrase uh, for when they introduce uh, Johnny Carson uh, on, on that Tonight Show. And so the court there said that even if there wasn't any uh, name or picture or anything that directly tied um, uh, the company to Johnny Carson, uh, the catchphrase, here's Johnny, was distinctive enough uh, that it did violate uh, Johnny Carson's um, uh, right of publicity. Um, so, you know, these cases just show that, uh, you know, it's not as easy as someone might think in terms of where you see infringement cases. Um, you know, it can apply in a variety of ways, and it doesn't have to be as direct as utilizing someone's uh, actual picture or name um, or, or, or some sort of likeness. Uh, it can be done in many ways that people thought it was indirect and harmless, but, um, you know, these cases have found uh, that, that they are in violation uh, of the celebrity's uh, name and likeness. So, so. Uh, that that's that's it for me in terms of um, uh, this discussion. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dina. Um, I guess I'll start uh, stop sharing. Uh, we do have a few questions, so I'll read okay. them off, and you can um, try and answer them to the best of your ability. So sure. um, there's about four questions, so I think we should have just about enough time. Um, and I'm just going to read them directly. Okay. The first question is. I thought that California law applied to deceased celebrities domiciled in California 
at time of death, paren, didn't the Marilyn Monroe case turn on that? The statute doesn't seem to expressly say. Is there any, is there other case law indicating residence, presumably at time of death, is sufficient? No, I, 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 I think, uh, I'm pretty sure it, it's based on residence, uh, not on domicile. And, you know, what the Marilyn Monroe case did was it, it allowed it to go back, you know, into the past uh, to deal with those celebrities uh, who have long passed away um, and, and gave them the opportunity to enforce those rights, and, and, you know, not necessarily, you know, post an enact enactment. The next question is, with the ability to digitally recreate a celebrity in media and performances post-mortem with new technology or even old technology, for example, Paul McCartney's recent duets with John Lennon in concert, lead to greater evaluations based on value at death? I, I think that's true, but but I think uh, you know the difficulty in those sort of situations is uh, you know uh, uh, I think you know what we uh, what 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 I discussed in the Michael Jackson case in terms of foreseeability, you know, uh, and, and I think it's one thing you know if if that sort of thing was done, uh, in, in, you know, and and it's hard to guess, you know, I mean, how do you know if it's never been utilized? per se, you know, for, for someone, um, how do you know that it's going to be utilized, you know, post-passing? And so I think, you know, a lot of that's going to depend on the foreseeability. If, if you have a situation, let's say, where you're seeing more and more uh, ads or performances that are using holograms and, uh, you know, digital images, then I think if it becomes the standard, then I think the IRS would have a much hard, you know, much stronger argument that that's foreseeable and therefore it should be in, included in the valuation. But if it's not, uh, then then I think it's still sort of an argument that they would have to make with certain facts to back their their premise. Uh, next question is: How is the right of publicity effectively transferred to a trust? or other transferee? Yeah, I mean, so uh, typically, you know, obviously, you know, people can actually sell it. And, and I've had some celebrities uh, think about selling. Most of them don't want to because they want to be able to control their name and likeness. But, you know, you can certainly have a sale that occurs prior to, um, uh, prior to death. Uh, but, you know, oftentimes it's going to be, you know, in the trust. And, you know, uh, I mean, typically it, it, the, the provisions will be indicated, you know, in terms of the trust, uh, you know, post passing that this is where it's going to go and this is who's going to receive it. Um, and that's normally the, the way it works. And, and sometimes we'll use a general assignment. I mean, we use a general assignment that tries to cover a broad array of assets outside of copyrights you know, because of other issues related to copyrights. Um, what is the difference between valuation of a trademark and valuation of name image likeness? Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, I, I guess I don't know, you know, all the nuances of the trademark as, as well as I do name and uh, likeness. So, I, I have some thoughts, but you know, I don't want to necessarily say those uh, in case it's not wholly accurate. So, um, and then there's just one more question and one more comment. So, um, I'll, I'll read the comment first and save the question for last. Sure. We had one comment from a viewer who said the issue of name and likeness is often found in family law cases, and gave a reference point um, for In Re Hiscopo two three one N J Super. Five seven six, and I'm just saying that for the benefit of the group. And then the last question we have is: in many cases, post-death name image likeness of actors actresses proves to have little post-death monetary value. Do you always have to put some name image likeness value on the um, 706 return? I, I would I would say no. You know, I mean, but but I think. Uh... You know, uh, I, I think if you have a recognizable person, 
Um, you know, and that's not to say every auditor would recognize uh, some people, you know, believe it or not. Uh, I, you know, I, oftentimes, uh, you know, I have some celebrities who uh, ask for a house trust and I've never heard of them in, in my life. Uh, I'd have to Google them. And, and so, um, but I do think that, you know, if it's a recognizable name where the general public would know, then, you know, perhaps it would, you know, it'd be, uh, it would behoove the, the, you know, the advisor uh, to at least even have a nominal value uh, so that uh, they can say that they reported that, um, you know, but um, yeah, so I, I do think that, you know, and, and there's been some instances where uh, we may not have uh, put a value because, you know, the person wasn't of enough uh, notoriety to be able to, you know, actually have any value. So. All right. I think that's it for the questions. Um, Chung, on behalf of the committee and the bar, we wanna thank you for your time, for your great presentation. And thank you for everyone who joined and participated. We appreciate your time as well. So just wanted to say thank you. D D Dina, I'll, I'll leave the audience with one last joke. And that okay, is, great. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure you know, people have heard this, but a, a young lawyer dies and, and, and goes to heaven. He says to God, I'm, I'm, I'm way too young to die. God looks at his uh, his uh, his chart and says, "But your billables say you're 110." So you know, uh, <laughs> it's probably not the best light for lawyers, but uh, you know, we understand the, where the lawyer jokes come from. So, well, well, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you again for your time, and we want to wish everyone a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs>